Good afternoon and welcome to this lunch times session on the accessible information regulations and the support grant that is available. We are recording this session and we'll make the recording and the slides available to you uh, in the next uh, day or so. Um, and uh, please do feel free to use the chat as we go through to ask any questions you may have got and uh, there'll be a couple of uh, points as we go along where we'll uh, have opportunity to have some uh, bit more interactive uh, Q&A. So I'm Tim Rivett and I'm going to uh, be presenting to you this afternoon. So uh, we will have a look at why the regulations have been brought in have a look at what they require you to do at a fairly high level um, and then look at the grant that's available and other forms of support. Um, as I say, uh, a couple of Q&A points uh, as we go through. So why have the accessible information regulations been brought in? As I'm sure you will have experienced as you travel around the country on public transport, travel can be quite anxiety inducing, particularly when you're somewhere where you're not sure where you are, where you might need to get off, uh, you know, uh, on a dark, wet night when all the windows are, uh, are steamed up and wet and you can't see out, then um, any form of assistance that you can have to let you know where you are is welcome. Now, if you take your experience and put yourself in the shoes of somebody with some form of impairment, doesn't matter whether it's visual, you know, hearing, cognitive, whatever it is, then uh, then you know the anxiety just increases because you've lost some of your senses, um, and so uh, travel can be extremely. Uh, challenging for people. Um, back in 2014, the Guide Dogs for the Blind did a survey and 70% of visually impaired responders said that they had missed their stop because the driver had forgotten to tell them uh, where to get off. Now, uh, I'm sure we've all asked the driver, you know, let me know when we're at wherever we're going if we're not sure and uh, the area that we're in um it's much harder as i've already said you know, if you have some form of impairment now that's not to blame the driver of course because they're sensibly there to drive the bus from a to b and it's really challenging to remember who's asked for uh, which stop and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, it's not unsurprising that uh, there is such a high number of, uh, of people that have missed their stop. Um, and you have to remember that these are people who travel significantly less normally just because travel is much more difficult. Um, and um, over two thirds of them said that uh, they would use buses more frequently if there was some form of audio visual announcement to, to help them uh, make their journey easier. So that's the the why. Um, now, if you've been to London in the last 15 years or so, then you will have seen on and heard on the buses there audio visual announcements introduced to help people navigate uh, London, both visitors and also those with uh, impairments. Um, and if you've been on new train rolling stock um, that's been introduced since 98, you will have also had uh, audio visual information on those trains. So it's not new technology, it's quite well understood. Um, uh, but what the department and um, users that are advocating for audiovisual announcements is saying is that the introduction on buses is not what it could be. And so if you take London buses out of the equation, less than a third of vehicles in England have some form of audiovisual equipment back in 2023. 
Um, Wales is a bit better, 37%, Scotland 35%, but still, you know, not much more than a third of vehicles. And so the rate of adoption uh, wasn't what is required. And so the regulations have been introduced to uh, to make sure that that adoption rate is increased very rapidly. So the accessible information regulations they require every local bus or coach service to provide audio announcements and visual information identifying a number of key things. So the route, the direction, what the next stop is and some additional information around diversions and things like that. And we'll come on to each of those things as we go through. So um, I'd highlight the uh, local bus services aspect of this so if you've got a bus or coach in England, Scotland and Wales operating local bus service then uh, you are in scope of these regulations now local bus service doesn't just mean registered bus service with the OTC uh, if you operate rail replacement on a uh, on a local uh, rail line, then you're almost certainly in scope as well, because the definition of local bus service is in a number of transport acts is uh, where somebody gets on and pays a separate fare to other passengers and gets off or, or can get off within 15 miles of uh, of where they've got on. Uh, so they might not pay you as a bus operator, but they're paying somebody a separate fare and um, branch lines and uh, and similar rail routes. Certainly the stations and stops are going to be uh, within 15 miles of each other. So uh, don't discount the regulations if you just do rail replacement, for example. Um, so um, the applicability has a number of exemptions. Some of these are fairly standard um, and you'll see them in a number of regulations. So small buses, less than 17 passengers, uh, they're exempt. Um, you should note that that is a different number to PSVAR uh, requirements. So just, uh, just bear that in mind. Um, if you've got what's normally classed as a heritage vehicle, so 1973 or before, then uh, you're exempt. If you're running excursions and tours, home uh, to school transport that's closed door, if you're open door, let anybody on if they're paying the fare, then that is not exempt, it's only closed door. Um, long distance where you're not meeting the requirements of local bus service um, and um, the whole route or sections of route where um, you're operating something other than fixed route, fixed timetable sort of arrangements, demand responsive, flexible service, whatever you want to call it. You know, there's lots of different names for that sort of service and um, older vehicles. So before October last year that are operating under community bus service licenses, if you've got a new vehicle, operating community bus, then you're in scope of the regulations. <laughs> so um, the regulations are being phased in based on the age of vehicle. Um, so um, if you have got new vehicles that you're expecting to be delivered after October this year, then you have to have them installed from first use. Um, if you've got, uh, and that includes vehicles that you might have ordered a couple of years ago and you're waiting delivery, um, uh, you need to uh, make sure that when they're delivered, they've got working uh, audio visual equipment on. Um, vehicles that are five years old in October this year need to be retrofitted before October um, and uh, all the way down to um, January 1973 vehicles, so uh, 51 years old, uh, you've got until October 2026. Now, quite key, the use of vehicle first used. So uh, it's not unusual to acquire vehicles from another operator or 
um, another country perhaps, you know, a lot of vehicles come over from Ireland. Um, the regulations uh, apply to not when you first used it, but when it was first used for a local bus service. So um, uh, you might need to uh, track back some of the history of the vehicle to uh, to know when the regulations kick in for that vehicle. Um, over a third of vehicles have got some form of audio visual already. Um, how do the regulations apply for that? So if you had um, a audio visual equipment installed on a vehicle before October last year, then you may be able to claim partial compliance and not meet the full requirements of the regulations until October 31. Um, so a little way off, but you do need to be providing audio and visual information before October last year and you're going to need some form of audit trail and evidence that that equipment was in place before then and what information it was providing. Um, the exact details about um, what you need to do to be able to, uh, to claim partially compliant uh, are in the regulations and the guidance. Um, you for the audio requirements under the regulations you need to be providing uh audio announcements over speakers in a way that is intelligible to passengers and the way that that is defined is that it's got to be uh, at least three decibels over the background noise for uh, just over half of passengers um, and um, that should be tested stationary at five and 20 miles an hour. So you get some uh, concept of real world working. Um, that may be uh, no, three decibels over background noise. Uh, could be quite loud for some older vehicles, for example, um, uh, if you're in the back seats uh, going uphill. Um, that might be quite challenging, um, and so to, uh, to 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 stop you having it so loud it's painful, um, there is a limit of 84 decibels. So the announcement shouldn't be more than 84 decibels. Where does 84 decibels comes from? Well, that comes from health and safety law, um, and you shouldn't be um, um, making people subject to uh, noise is greater than 84 decibels on a regular basis and so uh, you want to avoid having to provide uh, hearing um, protection for drivers and things like that so it's worth bearing in mind anyway um, as well as audio through speakers you also need to provide uh, or the audio through an induction loop you've probably seen uh, signs in banks and council offices and and quite a lot of shops have them these days um, where they have something on the counter or you know, built into the screen um, and there's signs with the uh, with the hearing loop uh, sign. So somebody with a hearing aid with what's called a T switch, they can hear the uh, hear the announcements rather than uh, coming through their ears. It comes through the hearing aid straight into their ears. Uh, removing any of the background noise and things like that. Now, you need to provide that hearing loop in the priority and wheelchair space areas. Um, you ideally provide it across the full float plate of the, of the vehicle, and you might find that's easier to do than just the priority and wheelchair space, but the regs require, uh, as a minimum, the priority and wheelchair space. Um, and you also need to provide signage to let people know uh, where the coverage is. As well as audio, you need to provide information in visual form, so you need some form of display. The regs are deliberately uh, technology agnostic, 
so uh, it's up to you to choose the particular technology you want you know quite often you see uh, leds and tfts being used um, the displays need to be seen by at least 51 percent of seated passengers in without any um, encumbrance so um, think about handrails and seat backs and things like that um, discount when people are standing and things like that the regs are quite uh, uh, you know there's some thought gone into them from that regard you know you're you're always going to struggle when you've got a vehicle full of standing passengers as well so um forget about standing passengers when people are sitting 51 percent of people need to be able to see it unencumbered um there are some requirements about minimum font height and things like that and don't use all capitals and, and things like that that make it easier for uh, people to read when uh, when you're on the move. Um, so the core requirement is to provide a display uh, for seated passengers. So typically that will be something that is mounted towards the front of a vehicle facing backwards. Now, what that does mean is that if you've got somebody in the wheelchair space, typically they will be uh, facing backwards when they're in the correct position and therefore unable to see that forward face uh, that rearward facing display so for vehicles that are first used after october this year uh, you need to work out how you're going to provide that visual information for passengers when they're in the wheelchair space facing backwards so that probably means you need an additional display that's forward facing. Um, now, that is only a requirement for new vehicles after October this year, but increasingly we're seeing uh, operators retrofitting those two existing vehicles to provide consistency of, of offer to customers. Um, so um, what information do you need to provide? you need to provide as people are boarding route information so the service number or name and um, some idea of where they're going so uh, the destination or uh, if you've got a circular route um, or there's a number of variations in the route that end up at the same place, then enough information to know that they're on the right bus going in the right direction. Um, and um, you need to provide an announcement uh, before the end of the route telling people that it's the last stop and therefore time to get off. Um, and that's one of the um, things that a lot of existing systems didn't do and so um, if you provide the basic route information but don't have the alert for the last stop then that's one of the uh, things that's allowed under partially compliant vehicles for example. So you need to provide route information, you also need to um, provide as you progress along the route uh, what the next stop is now whilst the route information only needs to be pre provided when you stop so for passengers boarding then not the next stopping point needs to be provided whether or not you stop um, and it needs to be provided enough in advance uh, so the passengers got time to hear the announcement find the bell push and the driver to stop without having to do an emergency stop. So you need to think about the timing for that. That can be a bit of a challenge on um, routes outbound from urban centres. You know, typically, you know, going through uh, built up areas, you might have stops every few hundred metres and you might be going at a reasonable speed. And so not a lot of time between stops. If you operate in Wales, uh, there are discussions going on um, with CPT and the Welsh Government in Wales about uh, the detail of those requirements because the Welsh Language Act does apply. Um, so you need to think about uh, the timings for 
you know, urban stops where you might not have a lot of time. Um, you also need to think about um, timings where you've got a rural stop, so you might only uh, service, so you might only stop uh, in villages um, or at um, particular points along you know, a, uh, a, a rural countryside area that might be two or three miles apart. Um, and um, so um, what you don't want to do is announce the next stop just as you leave the last one and passengers get up and move to the front of the bus while you know, the vehicle's moving and going around twisty turny roads for a few minutes. So you might want to think about actually making that announcement closer to the stop in those circumstances. So a bit of thinking and planning to do there. Um, a key thing is that the stop name that you use needs to be consistent. So if somebody's planned a journey online or using an app or something like that, the name of the stop that they've seen there should be uh, what's used in the announcement and should also be the same as the, the name on the uh, on the flag. Um, so customers you know, know what to expect, what name to be listening out for and looking for. Um, and uh, so, you know, we recognise and, and know that sometimes there's uh, there's, uh, you know, disagreements about the names of stops between operators, between operators and authorities uh, and with customers. So we suggest that if you've got that about particular stops, then um, that is probably a really useful use of an enhanced partnership to uh, to discuss stop names and come to some agreement where you've got those uh, those differences. Um, so um, that's the basic information. Um, quite a lot of services have some form of hail and ride section. So clearly you don't have marked and fixed stop points, so you can't provide uh, information, you know, and and, uh, and announce those. Um, so for hail and ride, what did you need to do? You need to be announcing the start and end of a hail and ride section. Uh, that needs to be an alerted uh, announcement. Um, and it's one of these situations where you might want to think about providing some additional location information. So. You know, if you've got a long hail and ride section, uh, announce when you're uh, approaching a particular village or, you know, a crossroads or something like that to help people have some contextual information about where they are um, so they know where to uh, to ask to, uh, to get off. Um, and the other one that's worth talking about is diversion information. So when you are about to go off route because of a diversion, you need to be informing customers of that. You need an alert uh, and you need to tell people you know, we're go vehicles going off route. Uh, and you also need to, uh, to tell people when you're back on your normal route. So uh, typically this will need some form of driver intervention. Most systems um, can't automatically detect quickly enough uh, when a vehicle is going off on a diversion. So uh, the driver will need to intervene. Um, and there are some circumstances where uh, you can't avoid that. You you go around a corner, you found that uh, the, the road is closed because there's a burst water main, something like that, you know, and you need to do a diversion on a fly. Um, but perhaps you can avoid some of that driver interaction by where you know there's a planned diversion in place for you know, a few weeks, then actually reprogram the system with the diversion. The driver then doesn't need to uh, get involved and uh, think about it and risk forgetting about it. Um, uh, at the moment, you might update your route if you've got a dive and the registration if you've got a diversion for, you know, six months, three months, whatever it is that you're off, you know, you decision you've made. But you might want to be uh, thinking about updating route information when you've got a shorter duration diversion 
to uh, to reduce the load on drivers and also improve information through other sources. So uh, update it on your audio visual system, also provide it to BODs and journey planners and things like that. So um, this audio visual information isn't just a fit and forget. Uh, just been talking about the need to keep it up to date when you've got diversions uh, if you change the route in a planned manner you need gonna need to reprogram if you're just changing the timetable and keeping the the route the same you don't um but if you you know changing the the, the route you're going to need to um equipment fails uh occasionally so how are you going to uh, allow drivers and passengers to report that how are you going to try and proactively pick that up uh, it's relatively easy to know whether a speaker system's working uh, or a display uh, but it's much harder to know whether a hearing loop is working or not because unless you've got a hearing aid with a t-switch uh, you're not going to know some systems have uh, LEDs and other proactive ways of letting you know whether it's working or not. Um, but even those don't tell you whether actually what's coming through is intelligible or not. Um, and so uh, it's advisory to to uh, get yourself a hearing loop tester, less than 100 quid, little box. You plug some headphones into and it pretends to be a hearing aid with a T-switch and you can hear what's being said um over the over your headphones um uh and you'll want to be testing that on a uh on a regular basis you know probably not every day but you know certainly once a month but part of you know uh you know more detailed vehicle safety checks and things like that um perhaps once a week you know, it depends on uh on failure rates and and, and your approach to maintenance um we said um think about reporting mechanisms particularly for passengers uh, you might not get very many passengers reporting things with um you know uh, your tires and things like that or hopefully not um but what we do know is that passengers they will be very attuned to the announcements if there's a stop missing they will notice i'm sure uh, and let drivers know so how is the driver going to pass that on to be fixed um how are you going to deal with that in your uh, in your depot um or back at base so you need to think about maintenance so that's a quick run through the regulations. Um, has anybody got any questions about the regulations at this point? Hi, yeah, Soji. Um, yeah, just a quick question with regards to uh, any reference to MOT um, in the regulation. Um, is is there anything in there? Does does it state you know how MOT would be affected? Uh, no, the regulations are don't say how enforcement will take place, um, but enforcement will be and checking will be through DVSA. So um, I'm not sure at the moment how they're planning to uh, to to check whether vehicles are compliant or not. Um, but you could assume that there'll be some form of uh, checking through some regular inspection process. Okay. Um, is there any way to find out? Um... Uh, well, I would ask your... So what we've been told is that your BOMs, your, you know, your DVSA business managers um, will um, know so if you don't know who that is then um you can email um inquiries at dvsa.gov.uk and they'll tell you who your BOEM is okay thanks Tim. we got any more at this point no okay come back to that later on 
So um, whenever new regulations and laws are introduced, part of the process for that is the department that's introducing them needs to do an impact assessment to understand the impact and implications of uh, introducing the regulations, you know, who wins, who's going to be disadvantaged, what any costs of compliance might be. So as part of introducing these regulations, the Department of Transport did a impact assessment. And um, whilst uh, there is a cost to the equipment, it identified that there is a disproportionate cost to small operators of introducing these regulations you know things like for example volume discounts if you're if you're buying two or three uh sets of audio visual kit um you're probably not going to get the same price as somebody buying a thousand uh, you know a very large operator they're going to get a better deal um and likewise there's some things that you know you're going to need to do um, whatever the scale of your operation. And so um, smallest operators are uh, disproportionately impacted by the introduction of this. And so uh, to help mitigate that, the Department of Transport um, extracted some money from Treasury. Um, no mean feat these days. Um, and um, they have asked us at Artig to uh, manage the distribution of the grant on their behalf. Um, and so we have a grant for smallest operators. Um, it's um, it's reasonable size, but it's not huge at four and a half million. Um, but uh, it should go uh, quite a long way for a good few operators. So to be eligible for the grant, You've got to have 20 or fewer in scope public service vehicles. So you may have more than 20 vehicles in total, but you know, some of those might be minibuses and things like that. And therefore out of scope. So think about the scope of the regulations. Um, you can't be part of a bigger organisation or group um, because then as a, you know, we look at that as a group level rather than individual operators. Um, vehicles have got to be being used on a local service, got to be big enough and not already have both audio and visual information. Um, and um, the um, applications need to come directly from an operator. You, if you're an authority, you can't apply. Uh, on behalf of operators, it needs to come direct from operators. So um, you can use the grant to buy equipment if you need speakers, hearing loops, displays, that sort of thing, um, and the cabling, that, you know, the, the equipment that you need. Um, what the grant won't do, though, to make sure it goes as far as possible is buy uh, surround sound speakers and a 70 inch plasma 3D screen for buses. Uh, it will fund the minimum spec that's needed to meet the uh, requirements of the uh, of the regulations. And whilst the regulations aren't techno are technology agnostic and don't specify you know, the requirement of any particular technology, um, Practically, when it comes to the display side of things, the minimum um, that you're going to need is is an LED display, you know, to show the uh, the the key information, the route and the bus stop uh, information. Um, a lot of operators are deciding to go with um, TFTs when they're installing uh, uh, displays because you can do more with them. Uh, you can provide additional contextual information. You know, this stops. This is where you get off for the zoo. Um, some are providing, you know, adverts for ticketing offers and things like that. Um, so the grant won't um, pay for TFT, but it will pay for LED. That's 
doesn't stop you as an operator going, actually, we want TFT. You know, we want to be able to provide additional information, um, in which case then um, you get a price for the TFT and you get a price for the LED. We'll pay for the LED cost and you top it up to TFT. Um, to pay for installation, um, we know that with the number of vehicles being fitted at the moment, uh, some of the suppliers have particular uh, challenges. They've got plenty of kit, but they haven't got enough people to do the installs. And so they're training um, operators, staff to uh, to fit vehicles and things like that. Um, so you might need to uh, you know, have installation done by somebody else. Um, we'll pay for um, you know, the training necessary and any you know, supporting infrastructure you need if you need some software to manage the uh, the the information about the routes, then that's covered. And the first year's maintenance. So that's what you can use it for. Um, we designed the process of applying for grants to be as simple as possible. You really shouldn't need to use consultants to help you with the uh, application process. Uh, the most you should do need to do is talk to an accountant, um, but it's very simple information. You know, how many vehicles have you got? What's your own license? Uh, what's your national operator code? Things that you should already have to hand and, and understand without needing to uh, write war and peace about why you want the money and the benefits of it and that sort of thing. You know, all of that is a given. Um, we're trying to make this as simple as possible. So to apply, you need a quote. Um, we're not needing you to get multiple quotes. Um, we are, however, um, comparing the prices for the applications that we receive. And so if you uh, put in an application and say it's going to cost £20,000 a bus to fit this, uh, we're going to go, actually, you might want to think again and talk to another supplier because that's way higher than anybody else's, uh, you know, and it may be that you've got a particularly uh, unusual vehicle with particular costs and things like that, but we're going to do some uh, some comparisons and some benchmarking of, of costs. Um, there's a simple grant claim form, so, you know, things like bank account numbers, VAT numbers, things that you should know. Um, uh, and we need that for some statistical stuff to know what coverage for the, you know, the operators applying are from across the country um, and uh, you know how to pay you as well. Um, there is a subsidy self-certification form that we need you to complete and this is one where you might need to talk to an accountant um, this grant is classed as state aid to a business um, and so we need to make sure that um, any other state aid that you've had over the last three years uh, with this grant doesn't tip you over the uh, the the, the amounts that you're allowed and that sort of thing. So uh, so that's why we've got that. And that's why you might need an accountant to go back over the last few years, because particular grants and things like that and um, uh, money that you get from the public sector um, are classed as state aid. Some things aren't and that sort of thing. Um, and um, there are, of course, some uh, terms to agree. Um, those are as fair as possible, uh, pretty simple, um, but you do need to commit to maintaining the equipment on vehicle in a working manner for five years after um, the uh, the award, for example. Um, so things like that. And that does mean that you know if you get rid of a vehicle and get another one, you're going to need to take it off the old one and put it on the new one and, and things like that. Uh, but uh, as I say, we've made those as simple as possible. Um, in terms of timescales, um, 
Uh, I know a number of you on the call were going, ooh, not a lot of time between this call and the 3rd of June, which was when the grant applications uh, were due to end. Um, however, um, yesterday uh, a decision was made to extend the opening period. Uh, I would encourage you to get an application in by the 3rd of June if you can. Uh, we'll then process all of those and let you know uh, during uh, as early as we can in June uh, whether you've been successful or not, um, sorting out any queries and things like that. Um, however, once we've gone past the 3rd of June, applications will be processed uh, on uh, in the order that they come in um, and it will remain open until uh, basically uh, all the money's gone. So um, that might be a week if everybody rushes in, that might be a month. Um, we don't know. So um, don't just see the extension as ah, oh, we can relax and, you know, we can apply in, you know, September or October or whenever. Um, get your applications in uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, we uh, are uh, in a slightly different position than the original uh, expectation where um, we were going to get announcements out in early July. We're hoping to be able to uh, do that during June for those received before the third, um, because um, the uh, the election uh, being called has changed some of the processes that we're having to uh, to follow, which gives us uh, a little bit more flexibility, fortunately, rather than the other way. So uh, get your applications in as quickly as possible. Um, we really do not think that there will be another round of funding next year or the year after. Uh, so we really do think that this is it. So if you don't have any vehicles that need uh, fitting by October this year, but you've got some that need for next year, don't wait. Uh, you know, this, uh, I do believe, is a one shot process. Um, so um, those that are received before the uh, third, um, it's a bit moot given that it's extended and we are unlikely to have spent all the money by the third of June, but uh, that was going to start with the smallest operators and work upwards. But uh, uh, I don't think it's going to come to that for the uh, for them. Um, so. Um, in terms of applying, uh, we've got a set of pages on the RTIG website, rtig.org.uk slash AIG. Um, there's pages of all about the regulations uh, and uh, supporting uh, advice uh, and pages on how to apply and, and where the uh, application online system is and things like that. Um, we've got a dedicated email address uh, and we're getting back to people same day on that um, so you can get quick responses. And if you know nothing about audiovisual kit on bus um, and want a bit of background, we've got a report on the different technologies available, things you want to be thinking about when you're planning implementation and installation. Uh, and some of the things to look out for when you're maintaining things and uh, and you're actually running them. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, grant and uh, support. Um, if you're members of CPT and things like that, then CPT team and album teams, they're quite well versed in, in the requirements and, uh, and have got some uh, some useful advice as well. So, for example, uh, if you CPT members, the online uh, manual has got lots of information in it. Uh, has anybody got any questions about the grant and support? Yes, Carol, hello. You're on mute if you're trying to say something. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me, Tim? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a local authority, we have our own internal bus fleet. 
um, that operates local bus services, we qualify for that grant. Uh, unfortunately, we're not allowed to give the funding to authorities. It has to go to operators. Right. OK. Hmm. The Fair department's enough. quite clear about that. All right. OK. Thank you. Uh, Linda. Linda, hello. You're on mute as well. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> That's all right. I should have realised, and I bet everybody does that. Um, I work for, on behalf of Swiss Strands, who are um, one of seven um, regional partnerships in Scotland. And what we are, we're not a bus operator, but we, we have um, 34 vehicles that we lease to operators. So we lease these out as part of their contract, you know, when they tender for the contracts. If they haven't got enough vehicles to sell, you know, they can get a leased vehicle from ourselves. So there's 34 currently, and I think only three of them are under the 16-seater. So you'd be talking 31, that would, but I don't know where we stand for that. Is that the same as what you just said to Carol for authority? Um, so as an authority, we can't, but I believe that you or a colleague was talking to one of my colleagues, Dave, yeah, this morning. Go, yeah, he's going to go and speak to DFT for these yeah. two queries, but I just wondered if you had any more information on that or yeah, we need to I mean, wait on David coming back. Uh, I have spoken to Dave since your uh, conversation this morning uh, and he will be getting back to you very soon. Excellent. Um, Thank you for that, Tim. OK, uh, Keith. Yes, sorry, I made sure I wasn't on mute. Um, <laughs> so just just a couple of quick questions. Um, one I'm hoping is a is a flat no. So under the terms and conditions, there's no requirement for operators to say that this is being funded by the UK government in the same way that there is for BSIP funding. Uh, so uh, there is. Um, and you will need to uh, put some uh, sticker in the vehicle that says that this is supported by DFT. It's, it's got DFT logo, it's got the RT logo and the Union Jack, I think, something like that on it. So there is. Okay, yes. so there is a requirement for that. Yeah, there is. I'm, yeah. I'm not surprised, but it, it would have made life easier if there weren't, obviously. Yeah, ab 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 absolutely. But uh, you can get the stickers from us once you get the award so uh, yeah. and then the the second part is um because i'm from um sorry county council um obviously i've been highlighting this to our operators through regular communications around the bsip and ep process thank you but um i just wanted to get an understanding of if you why you feel like there hasn't been the uptake um and what more can potentially be done because um, whilst we don't have a direct role in being able to bid, obviously we do have an interest in operators complying. Yeah, so we've been trying to encourage um, likes of CPT and likes of yourself through ATCO and other organisations to uh, make awareness uh, as wide as possible and through trade press and things like that, bar um, uh, if you're a large operator, you've got people that can pay attention to trade press and go along to, to events and things like that. But you know, the smallest operators, they're always the hardest to engage with um, just because they're busy driving the buses and, and running the services. Um, and so it is it is just a case of um, you know, as many approach methods as possible. Um, and thank you for... Um, you know, using uh, EPs and, and other you know methods of of getting information out there because uh, we we can see who's which authorities are being most effective at getting the message out. Um, so uh, you know, over the next few weeks, we will be trying to address some of the gaps in in around the country where we haven't got applications from anybody because um, you know clearly there are some places that are better than others at getting the message out. Have we got any more? 
Yeah, Linda. Just a final thing. Did you say at the beginning, Tim, that you'll be sending out these slides to us? The reason yes. being, I think the operators would benefit from actually seeing this because it sort of summarises everything for them. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we'll be sending out the, the slides and a, and a copy of the recording uh, in the next uh, day um to everybody on here and uh, there's a, lots of information including a, uh, a a quick sort of summary of of the regulations uh on the uh, on the RTG website for people so yeah thank you okay have we got any more yeah I'm Adam. I've got I've got a question. Oh, uh, yes, if I can, please. Yes. Hi there. Um, right. So I've uh, so I run a small company. We've got twelve buses, uh, nine of which go out each day. Can we quote uh, to have all twelve uh, retrofitted with these systems? So if they're all if they're all mm, in scope of the regulations. Um, so that you know they you obviously need some spares. I know because exactly uh, that, yeah. yeah 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 because okay. if, if if all are used interchangeably then then yes yeah no that's fine yeah so, so that answers that um my other question was um so i've had two successful quotes so far from two different companies one of them's coming in at around about three and a half to four thousand pounds i believe uh to have, have systems fitted. That's with getting uh, a separate company to do induction loop because I can't seem to find a company yeah. that do everything lock, stock and barrel. Um, so, so one question is, I'm assuming you'll accept like two quotes, like one for induction loop and one for the rest of the system. Abs absolutely. That's how most yeah, people absolutely. are having to do it. There's no, very that's few. fine. So I'm, I'm very <laughs> new to all of this. I've never apl applied for a grant before. So, and the other question I have is, oh, sorry, apart, going back to that question, um, uh, the other quote I've had is coming in around about five to five and a half, I believe. Um, so, so the one for for three and a half for everything, they cannot fit. They've added the pricing to fit, but they don't have the ability to fit because they don't have the staff. Um, I only have myself. I like to to uh, run 12 vehicles so I, I'm not in a position to fit myself so can I put in the quote for that for the higher one that's like five and a half who was saying they can do everything lock stock and barrel um submit and um we'll do comparisons to see what that price is compared to uh you know other um others um that are offering similar things and then um you know uh, we'll do that comparison and, and have that conversation if we need to. But uh, but yeah, because if you okay, can't so fit it yourself. Both quotes, essentially. Yeah. 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 OK, brilliant. All right. Thank you for that. OK. Uh, if you think of anything uh, afterwards, then please do feel free to uh get in touch um have a look on the website get in touch uh give us a call uh the arctic phone number is on the screen and my email address is on the screen uh you will get a quicker response if it's uh a grant or regulation question if you use aig at arctic.org.uk because uh, my email does get a bit backed up sometimes um so um yeah Thank you for joining this afternoon uh, and please do feel free to get in touch if you've got any other questions and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.